Hi there. In this lecture, we are going to go into the beginnings of Imperial Japan and the development of Buddhism, especially. Now, Buddhism has been around for almost a thousand years by the time it comes to Japan. It's traveled from India through Central Asia to China and now through Korea and on to Japan. And in this time, it's made enormous transformation. I want to show you, we see here the original India stupa, the idea of this solid uh, dome of, of rock that embodies this idea of enlightenment. At the very top is a very small uh, sort of umbrella shape. You notice how that umbrella shape starts to grow, become more dramatic. The idea of enlightenment, the sort of feature of the stupa that, that is the goal of Buddhism, you know, becomes and expands until in its time in China, the idea of the harmika, that umbrella tiered top to the stupa, becomes the building, the pagoda which was originally a kind of lookout tower in the Chinese architecture, expands and, and fills out into these really elegant uh, constructed wood towers. Now, the person who is individually responsible for bringing Buddhism to Japan is Prince Shotoku. Now, there were quite a few people who were actually involved in this. He becomes the person who legends give the most credit to. Prince Shotoku uh, worked to make this transformation. Uh, the arrival of Buddhism, like in many places in the world, was really it being adopted by the hierarchy, by the emperors or people at court, and then it being sort of disseminated through wealth and power and privilege to the lower classes. In Japan, there was a great deal of resistance to this change. People were perfectly happy with their Shinto practices, and they felt very protective of this. But through a series of skirmishes and accidents, Buddhism is suddenly uh, makes headway. Now, the reason for the change and why Buddhism was important to the court was that in the Asuka period, uh, we had this really nomadic court where every time an emperor died, they had to sort of destroy the capital. It was bad luck to live on. The next emperor had to then go build another court, a whole other set of buildings, and everything had to be redone. Uh, you couldn't live in the same area. And this was the Shinto tradition that had carried on for centuries. And so Buddhism allowed for the opportunity for the elite to kind of rethink their relationship to the divine and still maintain those Shinto rituals, but uh, allow for Buddhism to uh, shift the focus and create uh, a, a more stable and lasting government. So the emperor uh, was always this sort of very important symbol, a spiritual symbol, more than a kind of political symbol. So it was really important that the court uh, be able to rally the other uh, feudal lords and people to come under this new banner of Buddhism. Here is a very famous uh, series of folding screens that are illustrated biography of Prince Shotoku. And uh, this is how the story of the conversion to Buddhism has been told in the sort of legends. This is a complicated story. Um, these paintings were originally on folded doors during the later Edo period on freestanding screens. These panels have been designated a national treasure in Japan. We see, uh, again, the effort to convert the local populace. Uh, small Buddhist shrines were made. Here we see a clay tablet that has been sort of cast um, so that the icon of the Buddha and his bodhisattvas are there and his attendants create this idea of, you know, 
a, a place or a vehicle where the idea of Buddhist, Buddha can be worshipped. In the Nara period, as the government comes into its own, it fully embraces Chinese government. And here was the next really big shift and change. Uh, Buddhism and Chinese Confucian values and some Taoism all kind of come into Japan. And the Nara period is a period where Japan is trying to assimilate many of these new ideas and values um, in the architecture and the structure of government. Now, some things uh, the Japanese government and the emperor welcome these changes. Some things don't quite make the same change. One thing that doesn't really have the same sort of uh, way of, of working in Japan as it does in China is Confucianism. While there is an idea that merchants are not to be trusted in there, and that this idea of the landed gentry and the feudal lords uh, are very important, the uh, samurai class plays a very important role. And furthermore, in Japan, it seems women always maintained a slightly higher status. They were not uh, subjugated to foot binding and a lot of other sort of uh, practices that really uh, subdued women in their roles in China. So in Japan, we find women had greater latitude. They could own property and own businesses in many cases, things that were much more difficult for women to do in China in the ancient times. What we see in the arts and we see in other things is a desire to do this. The other thing that's really important about the Nara period is the adoption of, of Chinese writing system to write Japanese. So using Chinese characters to write Japanese was a really complicated matter because in some instances they use the characters uh, as Chinese characters, their meaning, and sometimes they used only the sound of the characters to convey the sound of the Japanese word they were trying to say. And of course, this was all very fluid at this time. But we have the earliest histories and chronicles of ancient Japan written at this time. And this is the Kojiki, the record of ancient matters. And so from this point on, this idea of a history, which is really sort of a Chinese idea of a history, which suggests there was an awful lot of Chinese influence on the writing of this record of ancient matters. But we do see at times some really startling and interesting uh, ideas about the creation of Japan, such as this passage here. So the two deities standing upon the floating bridge of heaven pushed down on the jeweled spear and stirred with it, whereupon when they had stiffed the brine, till it went curdle curdle and drew the spear up the brine that dripped down from the end of the spear was piled up and became an island this is the island of onogoro so here we have this kind of sexual metaphor and this kind of stirring of the waters has suggestions of sort of hindu ideas of of the creation uh, of the uh, world we can see the Chinese influence in this uh, amazing bronze Buddha in Nara, the Todaiji, from 752 CE. 2.5 million people contributed to the construction of this massive thing. It's over 49 feet tall and it weighs 550 tons. Okay, inside this we find a human tooth along with pearls, mirrors, swords, and jewels discovered inside the knee of the great Buddha. And these were the relics of the emperor Shomu. And so it was believed that it not only was uh, this great huge shrine to Buddha, uh, it is also uh, this important kind of place or repository of the relics of the emperor. So this idea of way in which political power and legitimacy and uh, religious power became unified. We also see some really remarkable uh, Buddhist statues uh, appearing at this time. 
instead of relying on bronze very often these are cypress wood which is a very durable uh, wood that uh, is not affected by insects that will rot here we see uh, the sort of surrounded halo of lotus leaves uh, giving this kind of wonderful sort of organic shape around this figure with its rather extraordinarily long arms uh, the face in the sense of peace is clearly a kind of based on a, a Chinese model. The figure here is holding a water jar, which is a miraculous elixir that relieves thirst of the devotees. So there's a kind of magic um, associated with these different uh, bodhisattvas. A very important development in tantric Buddhist thought in Japan emerges with this important uh, teacher philosopher Kukai, who brings to our understanding of Japanese uh, philosophy uh, a, a very important interpretation of Buddhist doctrine. In this, he developed this idea of a kind of unity that permeates the universe. As he wrote, a hand moves and the fires whirling makes different shapes triangles squares all things change when we do the first word ah blossomed into all others each of them is true now to interpret this we have to understand the idea is that in every part of the universe the entire universe is contained that we are made of the same stuff as the universe is made and so the things that happen within us happen in the spirit world happen in the outside world and this is sort of the idea of tantrism that the physical body is the vehicle to spiritual liberation and this is what's often seemed as kind of contradictory in a lot of buddhist thought which says you need to kind of put your your physical body away and uh, those kinds of things that the body desires are leading you astray from enlightenment in tantric buddhism is trying to sort of create a kind of mystical union between the physical and the spiritual and so what kukai says is a very important idea that is very influential in japanese buddhist philosophy and that is within any grain of sand you can find the whole universe so instead of trying to learn about everything in the world you focus on the one thing that is in front of you you are you're a potter or you're a woodworker you find your spiritual liberation in that singular task that devotion to that one way of life will bring you closer to understanding the whole universe than wandering around and trying to take it all in. So this is a very important idea and we'll see this come back time and time again in our understanding of the sort of spiritual relationship between an artist and their work. We also start to see a way in which uh, the Buddhism allows for a kind of, what we say, syncretic adoption of a lot of Shinto ideas. Uh, instead of sort of rejecting uh, Shinto kami spirits, a lot of them were sort of brought into this sort of very complex hierarchy of deities in Buddhism, this sort of um, pure land version of Buddhism that allowed for the people to feel that their deities were still a part of what was happening in Buddhism. So Buddhism, instead of pushing Shintoism out, was actually sort of absorbing it into its own thing. And this mandala with its complex hierarchy of various bodhisattvas sort of indicates the ways in which the Shinto is being brought into the Buddhist practices. We also have some really remarkable Chinese style architecture that is being brought into uh, Japan at this time. This is a really spectacular temple, the Byodin in Uchi, Kyoto, completed in 1053, uh, with this amazing sort of swooping 
roof line, is, the structure makes it look like a bird that is settling down on a body of water, it's open air pavilions, and uh, is just an exquisite building. I have not been to this in Kyoto, but a replica of this, if you're ever in the island of Oahu in Hawaii, on the sort of leeward side of the island, uh, in, in nestled in the mountains, you can see a really remarkable replica of this temple, including the giant statue within, this giant statue uh, of Amida Butsu which is the Buddha of boundless light, is, a, is an important part of the Pure Land Buddhism that we became very important at this time. Nyorai and Bodhisattva. Nyorai is the Japanese name for the enlightened one. It's the name of Buddha himself. Uh, Tagatha, the one who has thus gone. So in Japan, this is referred to as Nyorai. And Bodhisattva is the Japanese word for the attendant bodhisattvas. So this was Regent Fujiwara who promoted this. And this is really sort of the end of the Nara period and the internal corruption and the, the sort of internal weakness and the excessive influence of the Chinese Buddhist uh, monks led to the collapse of the Nara period and a kind of migration further north, establishing a new capital in Heian. In Heian, which is where we're going to spend the remainder of our lecture, this Heian period, we see a kind of move back to Shintoism. Uh, Buddhism is still there. In fact, we see here in this Shinto deity from the Heian period, we actually see it depicted very much like a Buddhist bodhisattva. So there's a way in which Buddhism has sort of brought in Shintoism. And the Heian era is sort of this kind of golden age of Japanese culture where all the things that really define what makes Japanese culture sort of uniquely uh a part of world culture, these are the things that begin to take shape in the Heian era. Here is an absolutely lovely Buddha of healing, yeah, Kushi Yorai, uh, from Japan, the late Heian period. Uh, I like to show this because you can go see this if you're in Chicago at the Art Institute in the Japan art section. They have this wood uh, sculpted Buddha. Notice the, the, the calm demeanor, uh, the delicacy, uh, and the, the, the gentle flowing lines of the robe. Everything is beautiful. And especially I want to point out this mudra, this gesture that this Buddha is making. Now, this is a, a classic gesture of fear not. But instead of it being fully upright, with the palm clearly open and the fingers together, we see this hand, which is sort of gently off to the side. It's like it just coming up, making the barest mention of this, this way in which it doesn't absolutely determine the idea of the mudra. Instead, it just kind of delicately suggests the idea. This is classic Heian culture. This idea, instead of seeing things directly or doing things assertively, there's a beauty, there's a grace, there's a restraint, and there's a sense of, you know what I mean when I do this, a uh, kind of way in which the people who are in the know know how to read this. I don't have to make it doubly clear. So we see a lot of Buddhist traditions that are being assimilated at this time in a way that they're made more Japanese. A very popular deity at this time is Zenin, the Bodhisattva, Kichigarba, Jizo Bosatsu. And this is a much later period. I wanted to show you this because you, you often see these statues um, with the iron staff and the rings in them uh, and this very childlike face. Now, this figure is uh, important because the staff was something that Buddhists actually used. It was there 
as they walked uh, as a way to kind of warn small insects and creatures out of the way uh, so that they wouldn't inadvertently step on them. And it's a way of kind of hearkening the sound of the prayers of the movement of the, of the, the priest. And so we see this uh, protector of children, Jizo Bosatsu, and the Shakuju staff. These are th uh, images and icons that emerged from the Heian period. So a quick break before we continue. Some questions to consider so far. Why did Prince Shotoku promote Buddhism? What qualities of Shingon esoteric Buddhism did Kukai develop? Now, moving into the Heian era. The Heian era is a period of extraordinary classical uh, Japanese culture. This beautiful writing emerges. This is kan, uh, kana. This is uh, often referred to as women's writing. It is probably the closest thing that imitates actual spoken Japanese. Unlike earlier attempts to write Japanese with Chinese, this new vocabulary, this syllabary, allowed for much quicker writing, much more fluid um, of expression. It wasn't so literary. It didn't have any that kind of Chinese pedigree and idea of, you know, high culture, but it allowed for a kind of immediacy that was quite beautiful and delicate. And so a whole culture of waka poems and poetry becomes uh, of age in this time. And this is how the courtiers communicated with each other. They passed poems to one another. And these poems, these pairs of waka poems have been uh, recorded and saved uh, over the years. And you can see them on these beautiful uh, decorated pieces of paper. What we see are leaves and grasses, uh, uh, some painted, some painted and dropped on in random patterns on the, the, pa the page. The page would be perfumed. There is ways in which all of these different things would send messages, coded messages, along with the words themselves. I want you to get the visual impression, the way the words float in and out of and mingle with these natural organic forms. Unlike a lot of Chinese writing, which sort of stays in discrete shapes, there's a kind of meandering, flowing, running quality that shifts and flows throughout the page. Here we see two more examples of this uh, paper that's been sort of treated, some of it's been cut, and different pieces of paper have been assembled or torn and reassembled very delicately. And this way creates this kind of rich tapestry uh, for the writing. Here are the pair of poems that we see on this page. Seeing someone off to a faraway place, no regrets to wet my sleeve with so many teardrops. And in reply, my tears that mourn your departure make the river swell. It overflows its banks. Now these pairs of poems, this sort of discourse of lovers, could be funny, it could be ironic, it could be deeply moving, but it's very formulaic in many ways. It's relying on allusions to other poems and other literary ideas, which would have been familiar at the time, which may be wholly lost to us today. One of the crowning achievements uh, in literature uh, at this time, and literally in for all time, was the really remarkable tale of Genji. Genji Monogatari Emaki by Murakasaki Shikibu, written probably around 1010 CE. Now, this original book is, is, is quite long, and it's a, of, of over a thousand pages, and it traces the life of Prince Genji, 
who is uh, accepted at court, even though he is as the child of the emperor from an illegitimate relationship, he is brought in. But the thing that makes Genji such a powerful person at court, even though he hasn't the lineage of so many others, he is a truly beautiful person. And this is a very important idea in uh, Japanese culture at this time. And when I mean beautiful, I mean he's not a good person. He's extremely handsome. He's so lovely to look upon that his beauty represents a kind of virtue. And so people are enamored of him. And so this idea of beauty as a kind of way in which virtue manifests itself in the world, that to be beautiful means that in a previous life, you must have done something really remarkable to be blessed with such beauty. And so beauty becomes a kind of means for virtuous participation. And that we see that idea even in the Buddhist shrines and temples, this idea that to be in a spiritual place, you must be in a beautiful place. And to be a beautiful person makes you a spiritual person, makes you a virtuous person. So this original story written down, uh, and it almost immediately becomes a huge succession at court. And we know of uh, readings that were performed for the emperor. And we don't know exactly who commissioned this, but this massive undertaking, some 10 to 12 hand scrolls, each containing over 80 scenes, and somewhere between 300 and 500 feet long, this beautiful handwritten uh, masterpiece of the tale of Genji, uh, where this uh, beautiful treated papers and amazing illustrations. Now, a lot of this is lost to us today. Only a few of the scrolls remain. Uh, about 19 paintings have survived, about 12 calligraphy fragments. Uh, but what we see is something truly remarkable. There are probably about five different groups of artisans working on various parts of this project to bring it all together. And it was incredibly ambitious, and it just shows you how much uh, importance the story was to the Heian court at the time. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details. Uh, I'll be sure to read in the story um, discussion in perusal. The style of the tale of Genji and the writing, like I mentioned before, this kana writing, which was a part of this women's writing, created the sort of perspective of the women at court. And even though the hero is a man, we are introduced to women in a way that gives us a sense of the kind of power struggles that are going on behind the scenes. This kind of peering in to the Yamato clan, the emperor's clan, and their lives uh, that are wholly sequestered within the palace. Uh, here's a very famous scene uh, where we, uh, Takayoshi, in the tale of Genji, where we see uh, an early springtime and the ladies at court are taking down the winter draperies and they are rushing about, um, stories being read to the empress. But in all the hubbub and excitement of the arrival of spring, someone has accidentally left the door ajar. And because of this oversight, a man passing in the corridor catches a glimpse of the woman reading, and he falls madly in love with her, and he plots her downfall. And so this innocent moment uh, of, you know, excitement and happiness for the spring actually is tinged with sadness. And this is sort of the the... the key idea in the tale of Genji, that nothing is wholly happy. Everything is happy, tinged with sadness. And even in the saddest, most despondent moments, there is occasions for hope and occasions for considering life going on. And so there's a sense of life and change and vitality in this story that are really quite uh, beautiful. So these paintings are often referred to as Yamoto-i, images of the Yamoto clan. Um, they're also Tsukyori-i, 
made up pictures, which means made up like a, a painted faces like makeup. And so they're colored paintings. Um, this is this idea of mono aware, the sadness that comes even when the, the, you're happy. There's a sense that it's going to pass. It's not going to last, that things are due to change at any moment because we're all just too happy here. So that's so happiness tinged with sadness. The figures in this these paintings are rather simplified. It's very hard to read their expressions. Their faces are a simple slit eyes and hook noses, and that literally translates into this sense of a kind of simplified facial features. We also have this sort of peering in to the building, this kind of roofless buildings, fukinukiyatai, this idea of we, the roof is taken away and we're kind of peering in in this kind of voyeuristic way, or like peeping toms, we can kind of see into something we normally wouldn't see. Uh, and there's a sense that these illustrations are, are kind of psychologically driven. We see the way in which the pillars cut across figures, uh, put a sense of the kind of social divisions and alienation that the characters are feeling uh, and the struggles they are having with their feelings during these scenes. Here we would read a scene as it would unfold and we can see how the drapery and the clothing sets the scene and then only in the end we see it's Genji with his child. Uh, and this is this beautiful, sad moment. His son is born, which should be a happy occasion, but he knows it's not really his son. He knows his wife has had an affair with his really best friend. And yet he has to acknowledge this as his own son, even though everyone kind of knows it's not. And so this moment, he is both happy for the birth of the child, but also sad because it represents his wife's own infidelity to him. Here, as I was saying before, this idea of the slit eyes and the hook nose, you can see how simply rendered the faces are on these figures. Here's another really beautiful dramatic moment where you can see a woman in a dilapidated building. Everything is usually very beautiful and very elegant. And so this is a very telling moment. The scene that it shows us this completely decrepit and broken down house with this woman who is a former lover of Genji. Uh, and he's come and he, by, quite by accident he runs into her. And she is just still devoted to him, even though she is now quite no longer attracted to him. And so the sense of poignancy, the sense of devotion, and the sense of the loss and longing that comes in the story of the tale of Genji. Now, women's painting wasn't the only painting that was happening during this time. There was also a, a whole other tradition, sort of referred to as otokoi, male pictures, and they were quite strikingly different. They had crisp, clear lines very distinctive uh, rendering of the faces, not so much color, uh, sort of like a Chinese uh, influence. You would see these sort of light brushes of color, uh, much more energetic uh, action, things happening in the world. And these male paintings tend to be stories and legends about the founding of temples, uh, things that were happening in the outside world. So this is Shigisan Engi, the legends of the Shigisan Temple. And here you can see this kind of wonderful characters, Buddhists, monks, you can see their expression in this kind of lively and fun, dramatic way. Perhaps one of the most famous of these sort of uh, otoko-i male style pictures is also a, a comic, uh, humorous parody of life in the Buddhist monastery, where we see frogs and rabbits and monkeys sort of acting out like Buddhists, priests and monks. Uh, and it's very clearly, you can see the brushwork is uh, influenced by 
the sort of Chinese way of rendering mountains and trees. But there's here a very clear sense of caricature that's coming through the movements and the attitudes of the animals. Uh, the, the title of this scroll, Choju Jinbutsu Giga, a scroll of frolicking animals and people, is a bit of a mystery. Nobody quite knows what story this is intended to tell. Uh, there is no text associated with any of the images, and many of the scenes are quite mysterious. Here we see uh, frogs and a rabbit dancing around, making a scene, falling over themselves, laughing. And there's just some extraordinary scenes where we see this frog Buddha and the monk there saying prayers to it. So what was the meaning of this? Why was it made? What occasion? It's clearly a parody by the, the attitude of the drawings. But beyond that, it is uh, really quite a lot that is still unknown. This picture storytelling is something that carries on, and Buddhist um, monks and priestesses would travel through the countryside with these painted scrolls, and they would tell stories. And one of the stories that's come down is a very famous dojo, Ji Engi Imaki, from the Muromachi period. In this, we see a story of a monk that is going on a pilgrimage. And one night, he kind of, this woman gets really infatuated with him. And he sort of promises to meet her, but instead sort of goes the opposite way, uh, trying to flee from her. And she's outraged that she felt like he was leading him on. He was leading her on, so she races after him. And so we see him. Uh, running to escape her. And as she's chasing him, she transforms into this dragon. So looking over from the far right, you can see the sort of transformation. And so underneath the robe, flames start to emerge. And finally, the sort of dragon head comes out of her. And then finally, she's fully transformed into a serpent. He crosses a river. She slithers after him. He goes into a monastery and hides under a bell, begging the monks to, to protect him. And the dragon comes in and wraps itself around the bell in this dramatic finish and burns the bell and him inside it to a cinder. You see this little black shriveled figure at the end. That is the end of the monk who lured on this jealous female. Anyways, it's a funny story. It sort of has a kind of Buddhist moral, but it really has a lot more sort of excitement and fun and uh, seduction that goes on that makes it more, much more entertaining than spiritual.